Okay, I got recording starting. So is Facebook is preparing to go live. while we letting people in. Okay. And we just waited for a few more people to join us before we begin. Okay, just want to let everyone know that we are recording this session and we are also live on Facebook, which is going to be on our Facebook page on uh, By the Numbers Lionesses. So thank you for joining us. And we will be letting people in as we go along. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Janine Gershon. And I'm Tawny English. We're and we, award are we are award winning trusted advisors. For, for accountants, attorneys, financial advisors, fiduciaries, trustees, and wealth managers. And we are by the numbers lionesses. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our Women, Women of Influences episode two. My apologies, my partner there. Learn how to detect Ponzi schemes from Kathy Phillips, attorney and author of Ponzi Proof Your Investments, an investor's guide to avoiding Ponzi schemes and other fraudulent scams. And we have Coral Hansen, CPA, who was selected as LA's Business Journal's 2019 Most Influential Woman in Accounting. I'm an accountant, so that's why, you know, <laughs> got to go a high five. <laughs> so today, we will hear from our guest speakers on how professionals and investors must arm themselves to not only avoid losses and liability, but to have an awareness to ask the right questions in order to figure out a fraud. So how many of you would like to avoid losses and liability? Me. How many of you would like to increase your awareness so that you ask the right questions in order to ferret out a fraud? Me. Then put on your seatbelts and get ready to learn how from our today's Women of Influence, Kathy Phillips and Cora Hansen. And just to tell you a little bit about these amazing women. In addition to her roles as lawyer, speaker, and author, Kathy Phelps also serves as a mediator and is currently on the mediation and arbitration uh, rosters for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, as well as the Bankruptcy Mediation Panel for the Central District of California and the Bankruptcy Mediation Panel for the District of Arizona. Kathy, is currently, senior oh, counsel, Kathy is currently senior counsel at Diamond McCarthy. I see, I'm so excited to talk about Coral. I keep interrupting, Jenny, sorry. No worries. So Cora Hansen is Senior Managing Director at Glass Ratner, and she's a certified public accountant, a certified fraud examiner, a certified, she's also certified in financial forensics, and is accredited in business valuation. She has served in multiple leadership positions with the California Society of Certified Public Accountants and was recently appointed to the organization's State Litigation Steering Committee, which oversees the forensic service section. Thank you so much, Kathy and Coral, for agreeing to be on our show. We absolutely love you and your passion for protecting people from falling victim to Ponzi schemes. Before we begin the presentation, Kathy, can you share with us the inspiration behind your book, Ponzi Proof Your Investments? 
Sure. Well, thank you, ladies, for having me today. I'm excited. It's always fun talking about Ponzi schemes. Um, and so I, this is the book you're referring to. I think Ponzi Proof Your Investments, a little ostrich with his burying his head in a bag of cash. Um, sort of representative of, unfortunately, sometimes what happens in Ponzi schemes. Um, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer, and I, you know, was doing bankruptcy law for a long time. And I got myself involved in about a $300 million Ponzi scheme case representing a receiver appointed by the SEC. And I had to recover money for these poor defrauded victims. And I was looking for the right legal claim to bring against a big insurance company and I wanted to do it right. So I went out looking for the right resource to help me do that. And there really wasn't one. Uh, and so I decided to write it myself. Um, but when I got a little ways into that project, I realized how overwhelming it was. Um, and I uh, invited a good friend of mine, um, a bankruptcy judge at the time, Stephen Rhodes, uh, to write it with me. So we spent the next probably two years co-writing an 800 page legal treatise on all of the law that arises in Ponzi scheme cases. Uh, we wrote the Ponzi book, a legal resource for unraveling Ponzi schemes, which is actually you can see behind me. Uh, once we did that, then, um, you know, I started following the news and the cases and I realized how prevalent the problem was and how many people were getting defrauded in these schemes. And so I decided to write an investor's guide, which is this one kind of written at a, a more of a 10th grade level rather than a legal treatise to help people ask the right questions to avoid investing in a Ponzi scheme. So that was the reason I wrote this. And then I also started writing a blog, the Ponzi scheme blog, just to keep track of all of the news uh, that's coming up in Ponzi scheme cases. And um, it's unbelievable. Every month I post on the last day of every month, how much news there is out there. So it's just really interesting to me. And I hope to get the word out there to help people so that they will avoid investing in a Ponzi scheme. Wow. <laughs> okay. If you want to get your copy of where, you, if you want to buy your copy of her book, I just put it in the chat box for you. Okay. Then you can buy it on Amazon. So please do because she, it's a great book. And question for you, Coral, how do you and Kathy, how do you guys team up in order to work, to work on a Ponzi scheme case? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today. Very excited to present along Kathy Bazilian Phelps. Um, Kathy would be the legal brains behind unraveling the Ponzi scheme. She would also be the person that would pro prosecute the fraudster. And she would look to somebody like me as a fraud examiner to investigate the fraud and possibly help present it in court uh, through trial testimony. And that's how we would work together as a team. And how long have you guys known each other? 15 years plus maybe? Yeah, okay. quite a while. Wow, okay. Well, before we get started, I want to see who do we have here? So I, I created a quick poll to see who we have, who are attorneys, accountants, and real estate agents. If you guys can click on the polls, we can see who we have on the call. It looks like we have a good mix. Some attorneys. Accounts. Yes, we do. Yeah, I know we, we, we're only eight minutes into it, so I know we have more people joining, but yes, we have, all right, we have a good mix. Thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, please do put in the chat box and we'll ask the questions throughout the presentation. And with no, with, no further ado, Kathy Coral, take it away. All right, well, we'll get started. I think I'm gonna start us off today. I did want to um, invite any of you who might be interested in MCLE credit for lawyers or CPE credit for the accountants. I am able to um, deliver certificates for that, um, depending on what state you're in. You may have different requirements. Um, but for California, I am able to deliver California MCLE and CPE credit. So what you'll need to do, um, if you want that, is to email me uh, at the conclusion of the program, confirm that you are in attendance, and then I will send you um, a certificate and some materials, and um, you can have credit for it. 
All right, so let's get started. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, well, I Ponzi schemes. I would like to talk about what is a Ponzi scheme for those of you who don't know. Um, give you a little bit of a flavor of what the types of characteristics are um, that we see over and over again in these schemes that, again, are still quite prevalent. We'll talk about the common tricks and, and tools that the fraudster uses to lure investors into the scheme. I'm going to run through, and Coral and I are both going to run through some notable examples. There were some really, really big cases in 2008, 2009, when the Bernie Madoff scheme was revealed. Um, and, you know, the market took a turn. We saw a lot of schemes get revealed. Um, and we may see a lot coming up, depending on what the market does. Mm -hmm. um, and then we really, most importantly, want to talk to you about some due diligence techniques that we can use um, in order to reveal these frauds. It just occurred to me I'm supposed to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint for you. So let me do that so we can follow along here. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, all right, there's our agenda. If we have time, we'll get to some red flag warnings. All right, so let's start with what's a Ponzi scheme. Well, it's a financial investment scheme that just happens to be fraudulent, right? It, it, it has the guise of legitimacy to it because that's the only reason that anyone would want to invest because they think that they're going to get some type of promised return. Some promised returns are actually paid to these uh, early investors, but the problem is the money that's being used to pay them isn't coming from any underlying legitimate business model. Rather, it's coming from new money coming in from new investors. So you have the illusion of a profit-making business but really, that's just uh, the new money coming in is just inducing further investment. It goes on and on. And ultimately, these things go bust because the perpetrator just can't bring in enough money to keep up with the outflow of returns that they promised to the earlier investors. Um, so that's generally speaking what a Ponzi scheme is. There's all kinds of factors that courts look at, um, but that's a thumbnail look at what it is. So what's a typical scenario of how this arises? Well, you've got your Ponzi scheme perpetrator who's going to do whatever they can to create an air of legitimacy, right? They're gonna hire the best lawyers, the best accountants, the best auditors, which is why we see so much litigation around these schemes because unfortunately those professionals also get pulled in unwittingly into a scheme. Uh, and that the perpetrator is gonna lie to the professionals, gonna lie to the investors, is going to provide false financial data, may have bamboozled the auditor to prepare a false auditor report, knowingly or unknowingly, that then gets disseminated to the investors. Perpetrator is also going to find an inner circle of people that are trustworthy who might have reason to know that there's a problem, but they may be making some good commissions by bringing in new investors and so on and so on. And then they almost always use a legitimate bank, often a big bank, um, because investors feel comfortable if they're sending their money to one of the larger financial institutions that certainly there won't be a problem. So that's typically what happens in, the, in, in a Ponzi scheme case. Um, so then what happens to all of the money? If the investor's money is not really going where it's supposed to go, where is it going? Well, we hear the stories about the airplanes and the automobiles and the jewelry and the girlfriends or the boyfriends or whatever it is. The money, a lot of money goes sideways in the process. A lot of money I see time and time again um, gets transferred to the insiders of the perpetrator, the family, the girlfriend, the friends, they buy houses and it's, it's oftentimes gets harder to, to trace the money. Um, but when you do trace the money, you see that that's where a lot of it has gone. Sometimes it goes offshore. I know everyone always believes that there's a huge pile of cash offshore. That's often not the case, but what happens is a lot of the money has been spent wastefully, um, often on, on good things like charitable contributions. You know, they want to put a good face on their scheme and look how, you know, generous I am. And so they'll make grandiose, you know, gestures and make sure that there's a news reporter there when they're donating a million dollars to whatever cause. Um, but really a lot of the reason that a lot of the money does disappear is because it does go back to investors to perpetuate the scheme because the, the perpetrator has to make some payments so that some investors will say, oh yeah, this is a good scheme. You should invest too. And then they'll bring in their friends. And the only way they're going to do that is if they're getting some kind of a return as well. So why do we call these things Ponzi schemes? Some people think we should change the name to a Madoff scheme because, you know, Bernie Madoff scheme, which we'll talk about in a minute, is the biggest ever. But Charles Ponzi, you know, he's made himself a name. He was around in the early 1900s from Italy, an immigrant from Italy, and he 
came up with this great idea how he was going to make money with international reply coupons, postal coupons. You know, and he was going to go to these coupons and buy them supposedly in other countries where they were cheaper and then bring them back to the U.S. and redeem them in the U.S., where he said he could do so for a higher face value and make a lot of money. So he promised to give investors a 50% return on their investment every 45 days. And he claimed that these wow. transactions yielded 400%. Well, about 40,000 people invested, and they invested about $15 million, which today would be a pretty small Ponzi scheme. But at the time, those were some real dollars, over $225 million in today's dollars. Um, it sounded really plausible to people. The thing about it, though, was that he never even purchased one of these postal coupons. So it was just a total fraud. Um, so I, I read um, an autobiography that Charles Ponzi had written, which was a really fascinating read, if any of you are really into this stuff. Um, and I pulled a few quotes from it, because even when he was writing this autobiography, you could tell he still wasn't fully responsible for what he had done. And he explained himself. He said, I was dealing in the most essential commodity of all, money. The whole, the world was my market, the whole of mankind, my clientele. And it just does give you a little window into how these Ponzi schemes can involve everything and anything. And, and anyone with money is a potential customer for a Ponzi scheme, irrespective of what the underlying business is. So it's a really, really pervasive problem. You know, and I, I, I see so many Ponzi schemes. And again, for any of you interested, if you go to the Ponzi scheme blog and you look historically over the last, I don't even know, seven, eight years, um, every little news snippet of the story is something slightly different. There's never two Ponzi schemes that are identical. Um, people are very, very clever about inventing these schemes. I think the most often, the most frequent Ponzi scheme we see would be in the securities industry, securities, bonds, a lot of foreign exchange type transactions. I've seen, at least here in California, many, many, many real estate Ponzi schemes. I think that um, it's easy for investors to feel secure in real estate because real estate's not moving. And so uh, perpetrators often come up with a scheme that, that provides a comfort level to investors when it involves real estate. So we see a lot of that um, hard money lending, um, you know, that, that type of thing. I've also seen several Ponzi schemes uh, relating to ATM machines, right? That also sounds kind of comfortable. Well, you are investing in an ATM machine and you get the cash that it spits out. You know, that feels kind of good too. So we see a lot of those and people invest in them. Um, advertising schemes, a lot of oil and gas, certainly a lot of oil and gas out of Texas. Um, things relating to drug sales, anywhere where there's uncertainty, where there's a lot of fluctuation in the price, um, you know, it's, it's ripe for a Ponzi scheme. Gold mines, which, you know, one would think one would be reluctant to invest in a gold mine because it just seems to have sort of a negative connotation, yet people invest in gold mines. Um, wholesale to retail, you know, oh, I'm going to buy this cheap and then I'm going to sell it and like, make a lot of money. We see a lot of schemes like that as well. Um, so there really is quite a large um, variety. And again, it could be anything. It could involve absolutely anything. Kathy, I wanted, to, I wanted to interject really quick. So um, I often check your Ponzi blog. And I think the thing that was, even though I'm, you know, very aware of the, the issues from you know, a forensic accounting perspective, I was absolutely blown away. It's the number of new cases there are on a monthly basis. I think most people think, you know, they hear of the big Ponzi schemes and they think to themselves that they're probably not at risk for being sucked into a Ponzi scheme because they seem so grandiose. But the fact that there's so many that are being reported on a monthly basis, I felt was a big eye opener. Oh, it is. And I guess I'm, I'm a little jaded to it because I've been looking at it for so long. But it's true. I mean, I think the ones that, that hit the press, you know, the Bernie Madoffs of the world are not that many. But on a daily basis, if you're just, you know, just looking at my Google alerts, I mean, they're coming up every day. And they're smaller. I mean, a, a small Ponzi scheme might involve a couple million dollars, you know, and the larger ones can involve a billion dollars, right? So there's really quite a range. But you know what, if you lost your life savings, I'm not so sure it really matters how large the, the, the whole scheme was. What matters is how much money you lost. So it is, it is overwhelming. It's, a re, it's an ongoing problem. I think given our current climate and our current, current market, there are potentially a lot of schemes about to be revealed if the market takes a turn. I also think that there are not a lot of new schemes being initiated right now um, because people are looking to make a quick dollar. Um, so it's, 
it's a it's a it's a risky time for Ponzi schemes. So you know, part of the reason I really enjoy doing this presentation is to keep people's eyes open and really on high alert for that. So, so Kathy, I'm sorry, Kathy, before you go to this one, um, what what you know, can you give us an example of a real estate you know Ponzi scheme? Since we have some real estate agents on the call. Um, sure. You know, if um, I'm going to buy, um, me the perpetrator, I'm going to buy um, some property and it's really it's distressed real estate and I need your money to fix it up and then I'm going to flip it and I'm going to make a lot of money. Um, I will give you a guaranteed 10% return. I will give you a first lien against the property, even though there's already a first lien from whoever the purchase money transaction, or even though I've given three other liens on the same piece of property to other investors. Um, and there's no way you can guarantee a 10% return because you don't know what kind of profit you're going to make on the property or how much the expenditures are going to be to fix it up. And so, uh, you know, fix and flip schemes are, are quite common. Um, so that's one example. Thank you. Um, sure. So I'm going to run through a couple of other examples that are just kind of my favorites, just to give you a flavor of, of how these things can really vary. This is the goat scheme. You know, this one was out of India. And if you buy one goat, you will be guaranteed a 2% monthly return. And you can double your money every three to four years if you just purchase this one goat and the perpetrator is going to rear that goat and take care of it. So investors were told that each goat gives birth to four kids a year and the new goats would then be sold to other investors. And so you get fourfold appreciation, you know, whatever in the first year or first couple of years. So my question to all of you is what due diligence question would you ask, right? You guys have anything to say? My first question on this one would be, so yeah. is it a boy goat? Or right, exactly. Goat. It's like, are you gonna make sure I'm gonna get a female goat and then who's gonna impregnate her or? Exactly, right? So I don't know that anyone was asking these questions. Lots of people lost their money in that scheme. And then I read about after I heard about that one, it was a, a pigeon scheme, the pigeon king. And it was, you know, it was not dissimilar. You know, you buy a pair of pigeons, a male and a female, and uh, you enter into a contract with you, you have a choice, a five year or a 10 year contract. And the company agrees to buy back the offspring of your pigeons and we're going to give you great returns. Well, somebody asked the perpetrator, I don't know exactly what the timing of this question was, but how do you tell the sex of the pigeons that we're getting? Like, you know, how do we know? And the perpetrator said, well, duh, you know, just like you do in humans, you hold a, a string with a needle on it. And if it goes in circles, it's a female. And if it goes back and forth, it's a male. You know, and people believe that kind of stuff. And it's just distressing. Um, so this is why we're going to give you some practical due diligence questions to ask if you're vetting, you know, a pigeon or a goat scheme or anything like that. I do have one more animal scheme for us, the emu scheme. This is another good one. Uh, this one actually was also out of India. You know, it's interesting. You know, the schemes out of India involve animals. We have bonds and securities and foreign exchange here in the U.S. So it kind of does depend where you are. But the emu okay. scheme. This one, if you invest money in emus, they are a delicacy in New Zealand. And you can, you know, fetch a, a good price for the oil and the meat of an emu. So if you buy a baby emu chick and you pay to raise that chick after two years, you can trade it in for a new chick and you can double your money. Well, nobody ever bothered to really check whether emu meat and oil was a profitable venture. And so 10,000 investors lost about $50 million in this scheme. Are you serious? People really fell for that? They, well, not only did they fall for it, but the perpetrator actually had purchased 100,000 emus. So there was an air of legitimacy. If people okay. did their due diligence, they might have actually seen the emus. Well, what happened is that there were 100,000 emus wandering the streets of an Indian village when this whole thing ended up going bust at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, this one required a little due diligence on whether or not there was the, the profit margin in emu meat and oil that was represented. And then one more, just for fun, the flexi potato purchase scheme. <laughs> like this one, too. If you buy potatoes when they're cheap, and I'm not sure what the flight price fluctuation is, you freeze them. I'm not sure how well they freeze. And you sell them when the price goes up, you are guaranteed a 20% return. Uh -huh. So you can think of all the due diligence questions you would ask here, right? Do they freeze right. well? What's the price differentiation? How do we guarantee 20% returns? Who are we buying them from? Who are we selling them to? We sell into. Yeah, exactly. So all kinds of problems with that one too. 
So let me move to, um, you know, the most famous, other than Charles Ponzi, the most famous of them all, Bernie Madoff, right? So there was over $17 billion in stolen funds. Now, on this one, people, you know, there were numbers early on in the case thrown out about $60 billion. Well, the $60 billion number was the returns that had been promised to investors. So if they had received back everything they had been promised, the losses would have been $60 billion. The actual out-of-pocket losses were just a mere $17 billion, right? Huge numbers in this case. Well, it was based on what Madoff called his split strike conversion strategy. And we're going to refer back to some of these things we talk about when we talk about how to try to spot a Ponzi scheme, because this is typical. Like, what does that mean? I mean, it sounds pretty good. It sounds impressive, right? I know. I don't know what that means because he's smarter than I am. And he's promising me some pretty consistent returns that are better than I can do elsewhere. So I'm in, right? And so he came up with this name and it was it was credible and it sounded pretty good. Well, so what are some of the red flags in this case? You know, hindsight's 2020, of course, but when we look back, should people have seen some of the stuff? Well, one of my favorite places to look first is the auditor, right? Who's the auditor? Is it a legitimate company? What kind of reports is that auditor putting out? Um, who are they? What have they done? You know, eh, do a little investigation. So in this case, the auditor was a pretty telling story. There were three guys um, in a strip mall outside of town who were the supposed auditors, um, only one of which was an actual CPA, I believe. And they um, were running a hundred billion dollar audit, right? Year after year, supposedly. There is no way that these three people could have ever accomplished that, nor would they have been in a little strip mall outside of town doing Bernie Madoff's audit. Um, and the audits also, interestingly, didn't show any customer activity. Another curious thing about the audits. So no one ever really checked that, probably should have. Another one of my favorite parts about, well, favorite in hindsight, obviously I'm not an investor in Madoff, but uh, sad parts about this is that he only delivered paper statements to the investors. You know, somebody as sophisticated as Bernie Madoff should have been able to give them real-time access to their accounts so they could see what was going on. Well, he didn't do that. He would wait until the end of the day and falsify them and create them to create the types of returns that he represented that he was giving to them. You know, I had read an interview by Madoff before his scheme was disclosed. Uh, you know, when he was kind of bragging about how he was able to do his split strike conversion strategy. And he said, well, the key to my successful strategy is timing and stock picking. Well, you know, now, when we look back on that, well, the timing was, let me wait for the markets to close. And then the stock picking was, well, let me pick the stocks that happen to perform well, and then create a false statement and stick it in the mail to my customers. So a week from now, you know, they'll, they'll see how well they did. Um, so that was a real, a real problem, um, obviously, in that case. Now you say, well how, well, how is the investor supposed to know that? Well, maybe not. But uh, the low correlation to the market was was a real red flag, right? How was he doing so well when the market was not doing well at all? Uh, you know, there was a whistleblower right. in the Madoff case, Harry Markopoulos, who went to the SEC multiple times complaining, saying, look, something is wrong here. Well, he pointed out to the SEC that from 1993 to 2003, Madoff had only lost money in three months, but the S&P was down 57 of those months. So there was really no nexus to reality. And additionally, nobody could replicate Madoff's strategy, which was also a little bit troubling. Now, from the investor standpoint, what they could have done is actually looked at their statements. And what they would have seen, many of them, is that there was trading activity on the weekends. They weren't even careful enough when they were falsifying these things to make sure that they were putting down dates, you know, on business dates when the market was actually opening. Um, there were also things like the sales of a given security, like ExxonMobil was an example, but the volume that, that Madoff was trading was actually more than the daily volume in real life. Um, so there were all kinds of wow. problems. Of course, Madoff was intensely secretive, you know, when he had an interview, he was like, well, I can't tell you, you know, but the secrets behind my strategy, because, you know, that's what makes me successful. So, all of these things are red flags. I mean, we could go on and on about the Madoff scheme, but um, you know, the question I think Coral's going to talk to us now about the question is, well, 
why did this happen? And what about our regulators? You know, why didn't the SEC detect this fraud? Well, why don't you take it over? Yeah. And you're on mute. Yeah, yeah this is a really, well, for me as a forensic investigator, this is very disturbing to me because, um, you know, traditionally there are steps that you need to follow to investigate a, a fraud. And when you're an investigator, whether you're an auditor or you're a forensic investigator like myself, you need to approach every engagement with a healthy level of skepticism. You don't go in necessarily thinking that somebody's committing fraud, but you certainly consider that as, an, as a possibility and you keep your eyes open. So the first thing you need to do is whether you're going to identify the allegation of a fraud. And I, uh, when I was uh, looking into this, Kathy, it seemed to me like there were several um, uh, reports from various individuals with a great amount of detail. I mean, pages and pages of very technical detail, um, really kind of trying to rat Madoff out way before he ever got caught. And maybe you can speak to that later because it, it's, it's sort of mind blowing to me that the SEC didn't give that any attention because as I read it, it was, it was like red flags. Here's, here is the, here's the investigation for you. I've done the work for you. This guy's committing fraud and they, they didn't follow up on those things. The second thing would be to examine the documents relevant to the allegation and do other evidence collecting activities and then interview the li likely suspects. Well, number two and number three are oftentimes the most important. Um, you can gather very good information from suspects, but if they're suspects, they're likely to lie. Um, if you're a good investigator, you can spot some of those um, body language issues, et cetera, um, or maybe you can sort of convince them in a uh, strategic way to admit more than they would like to. But the bottom line is number two and number three here of actually getting the documents, evaluating them, um, and doing an actual investigation is what you need to do to detect the fraud. And in reading about this, the SEC basically stepped from, from step one to step four. Um, so next, I think next, no, we're on one slide. Um, so for example, and I remember I watched the, uh, the movie on, on Madoff and I was just blown away by this because when the SEC investigators were investigating, um, they could have gone to the uh, depository trust company, which maintains all of the record keeping for the uh, security balances. And had they done that, they would have seen that there was no activity in certain years and probably the fraud would have been uncovered right then and there. But instead of going to a third source, and by the way, this is auditing 101. Um, you don't go to the person that, that you're you know, evaluating and ask for documents. You go to a third party to evaluate things. But instead they asked yeah. Madoff, hey, would you provide us with the statements? Um, you know, because that seems reasonable. And so he did, and of course they were, um, you know, doctored and were incorrect, and it was completely missed. Um, in uh, in a, it's, uh, the office of the inspector general, they said that if they had sought the records from the depository co trust company, that they probably would have un uncovered the Ponzi scheme back in 1992. So I wonder to myself, Kathy, when I look at these things is, you know, what's happened to these organizations and the SEC when they haven't done their job? I'm kind of curious to, to maybe ponder that at some point. Well, they did get sued. <laughs> um, I don't know successfully, yeah, you <laughs> but they did, they did very, very detailed um, internal report, the SEC did. I was actually impressed. They took the time and they saw all of their flaws and mistakes. Um, I do think that things have changed because of it. Are they perfect? No, <laughs> but one step at a time, I guess. Yeah, but well, that's good because it was pretty alarming. I didn't have time to figure out, you know, how far the rabbit down the rabbit hole of, of holding people accountable it went. Um, also, the SEC, they drafted a letter to the National Association of Securities Dealers, and they were asking for independent trade data as well, but they never sent the letter because they assumed that Madoff was not actually committing a fraud. And so if he's not committing a fraud, he's actually trading securities, their assumption was that the information they were going to get back was so voluminous, they wouldn't have time to investigate it. Yet the irony of it is he wasn't actually trading securities. I mean, he was blatantly bilking money in the most primitive Ponzi scheme type way. And had they requested those records, they would have seen that there were little, little or no records to take a look at. 
Um, so I think, you know, the most important, you know, lesson here is to have a healthy level of skepticism, which obviously the, the investigators did not employ that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I had to say on uh, the investigation part. Okay. Sorry, my screen got a little messed up here. Um, yeah, I think that that's exactly right, Coral. I think it's just, it's such a shame. I mean, can you imagine a, an investor who lost all of their money looking yeah. at this SEC report thinking, really, it's your job to vet these types of things and you didn't and I lost everything because of it. It's, it's heartbreaking. It, it was, it really was. I mean, the, I, I heard the stories. It was really, you know, tears, you know, well, bring to your eye. Sadly, what I see as a, as a fraud investigator regularly is most fraud schemes are not that complicated. They really aren't. People are simply not paying attention and doing the basic amount of due diligence. Oftentimes in embezzlement schemes, et cetera, if you look, literally just look at the checks, sometimes people are just writing checks to themselves and the company. Um, and so there's this, I think there's this aura out there that all fraud schemes are in, you, know, you know, super complicated and you'd never uncover them. But the bottom line is if you actually start digging and look at the underlying figures, most of the time it's not that, it's not that sophisticated. It's too simple sometimes. Right. It, it actually, from my perspective, it's just kind of mind blowing that it, you know, you kind of feel bad getting paid for it sometimes because it's so obvious, you know, how it was done. I think the most important takeaway though is to, you know, when you have a case like that is to do what Kathy and I are trying to do and educate people, you know, even if it's after the fact and what they can do to make sure that these kinds of things don't happen in the future, whether it's with small businesses and fraud prevention or big things like Ponzi schemes. So Coral, do you want to go through, um, a couple of the other sure. schemes that the, the bigger ones. Um. Yeah. Let's, let's do the Allen Stanford fraud. So okay. uh, the Stanford fraud was only second in size to the Madoff scam and it involved billions of dollars um, pertaining to fraudulent CDs. So there were a total of $7.2 billion stolen. Um, it involved 21,000 victims over 113 countries. Um, he was sentenced to 110 years in prison um, and this is just like an overall, and the scheme was largely centered in Antigua. What I always think it's interesting is, you know, how do these individuals gain the trust of people to perpetrate such a large fraud? A little bit of background right. about uh, Stanford. Well, he made a fortune with his father in the 80s by buying up this depressed real estate and selling it when the market recovered. Um, I think his father then re retired and Stanford moved to the Caribbean and ultimately settled in Antigua and started Stanford International Bank. So what he started doing there is, um, you know, developing relationships, rubbing elbows with the rich and famous. Um, he actually grew to fame in Antigua when he created and funded the Stanford 2020 cricket tournament uh, for which he built his own ground in Antigua. So now he's kind of running in the hobnob circles. It's, you're gaining credibility. Um, he ultimately became the largest private sector employer and was knighted for his service as Sir Allen. So now you have this individual with a lot of money. Um, you know, he's, he's heavily involved in cricket. He's now Sir Allen. Um, so he's, you know, grading, you know, gaining a, an incredible amount of uh, uh, credibility. Um, and also one of the things that's interesting is the scheme was largely in Antigua, and so he wanted to weaken the country's banking laws. So he established, this one kind of blows my mind, he established a task force of nine individuals, three of whom were partners at a large national accounting firm, whose name I won't, will admit, wasn't us. <laughs> and the complaint alleges that the key initiative from the Stanford Task Force, fully known to the USA accounting firm, was to amend Antigua's Money Laundering Prevention, Prevention Act to ensure that fraud and false accounting did not fall under the act's prescribed list of violations. So he was using his influence and power to really, really try to modify things in his favor. So let's talk about what the red flags are. There's a lot of red flags in this case. And once again, it, it just makes you kind of shake your head. Um, the investments had very you know, high rates of return on CDs, much higher than market. Um, he was promising investors 15%, which was quadruple what the US was offering at that time. 
Uh, he had former disciplinary actions. So this is, you know, this is going back to do, do some due diligence, look into the backgrounds of these individuals. He had uh, disciplinary actions for misleading investors uh, pertaining to sales materials and the risks of CDs, which was the underlying uh, per, you know, issue of his fraud, not having enough capital to function properly as a securities brokerage firm. He had lawsuits filed against him, which you can also uncover through public information. Uh, former employees had filed lawsuits that Stanford was running a Ponzi scheme and sold the CDs based on inflated returns and had destroyed documents. These are kind of things that you'd think would gather someone's you know, attention and things that as a potential investor, you could uncover if you look for this information. The board of directors was Stanford, include Stanford's father. The CFO was his college roommate. Top officials were related to each other. And so when you've surrounded yourself in this business with your friends and family, even if let's just say that somebody wasn't involved in the scam that's in your inner circle of friends, they're not going to ask questions of each other because they're related and they're friends. So um, his auditor, as Kathy was talking about with Madoff, he was a, a tiny little known auditor uh, based in Antigua. Um, the Stanford Group Company failed to register with the SEC. The bank, now this is interesting, the bank reported identical portfolio returns of 15.71% for two straight years in 95 and 96. That to me, I mean, that, how could you mimic, how could you possibly mimic that? Uh, but then again, if you're not looking, you're not looking. Uh, Stanford's company claimed losses, this is huge, of 1.3% in 2008. And we all sadly remember 2008 a year in which numerous markets were crushed and the S&P was down almost 40%. So here's a company only down 1.3%, the rest of the market's down 40%. Uh, last, he, uh, Ellen uh, Stanford held himself out as related to the founder of Stanford University. Uh, the former governor, uh, Leland Stanford, filed a trademark infringement case against him for deliberately misusing the school's name to cause confusion. So, you know, you just scratch your head, Kathy, with, you know, with all of these, these red flags, but the bottom line is so much of this, so much human nature places on credibility um, that, you know, it allows people to get away with these kinds of things. Absolutely. Yes. So let's move on to a couple of other uh, less large cases. Uh, let's talk about Thomas Petters, Petters Company, Inc., um, in this particular case, um, there was $3.65 billion that were stolen. Uh, there were 432 investors. Um, Petters took in money from investors to supposedly finance the purchase of electronic consumer goods that he was going to resell to big, big box retailers like Costco, um, like Costco. And the electronic goods, they actually didn't exist. And Petters used the investor funds in his Ponzi schemes. Ponzi scheme, so pretty straightforward. Or, um, I'm sorry, how did he? Okay, how did he um, sell the sell these? I mean, how did he get the funds? Was it through you know Morgan Stanley or you know, through regular investment banks? I mean, how did how did this happen? I don't know what the background was of this particular individual. Like I know that Stan, where Stanford got his wealth, and I know where Bernie Met Mayford got his health. Maybe Kathy does. Tom Petters tended to go to larger hedge funds to get the money for the investments. He wasn't so much the, the one-off smaller investor like, you know, Madoff was, but uh, Petters, I think, aggregated okay. it in hedge funds. And so he would bring the money okay, in so, so he could supposedly I... buy the products at wholesale to sell retail, but then he wasn't actually buying the products. And, so you know, he hid one... behind the hedge fund. Okay. Correct. So, and, and once again, there were red flags that if somebody doing their proper due diligence could have uncovered. He had been involved in multiple laws over a 13 year period. He'd been accused of not paying money back, not, and was accused of check fraud. Um, a litigation search would have picked up the problems. And, you know, if you were to see somebody that was involved in multiple lawsuits, I think as an average person, you would question whether or not you want to invest with that person. Um, you know, he did a lot of charitable giving. And so a lot of these fraudsters will take some of the money and do high profile charitable gifts because people, it's hard for people to think that if they're stealing all this money, why would they turn it around and then give it away for a charitable cause? Mm -hmm. So it gives them an illusion of being a good guy. Um, he also, if you would have checked into this, said that he had a degree from St. Cloud University, but if you actually, actually checked, he never obtained a degree. 
and he entered, he uh, was he eventually sentenced to. Oh, Carl, you just went on mute. That's weird. Okay. I didn't push anything. Yeah. Um, maybe I pushed the space bar. Um, all I said is the guy didn't have a degree, although he said that he did have one. And the way that he got caught is one of his coast conspirators actually ratted him out and wore a wire and got him to admit um, that the purchase orders for these electronic goods were faked. And when, when interviewed, he actually said that it was divine intervention was the only way to explain the fact that they hadn't gotten caught previously. Divine intervention. <laughs> divine intervention. So, you know, even the fraudsters are shaking their head about the fact that they're continuing to get away with these kinds of things. And last, let's talk about Scott Rothstein. Um, he stole 1.2 billion in funds and 259 victims, took in the money from investors uh, to provide short-term bridge loans to clients um, that were, and these guys are kind of vulnerable, that were parties to settlement agreements of lawsuits involving sexual harassment and workplace discrimination. They need their cash immediately and they would accept discounted payoffs to be funded by the investors. So you're kind of taking a, a group of people that are vulnerable right now because they, you know, they're being accused of sexual harassment. They need money to fund their case. And so you know, he was able to have a captive audience in that regard. He sold this discounted legal settlements um, for annualized returns. It's going to be as much as 437%. Uh, the right red flags was that he controlled all aspects of his law firm, uh, the guaranteed high returns, and he also lived a particularly lavish lifestyle. Now, on one hand, I think that if you're going to have a money manager or somebody that you're investing with, you want to see that they're doing well. I mean, you don't want them to pick you up on a moped um, and take you to lunch because they're investing with your money. But this guy had a vintage 1967 red Corvette convertible, a red Ferrari F40 coupe, a red Ferrari F430 Spider, a yellow Mercedes McClellan, a black Bugatti, a blue gray Maserati and a 2010 white Lamborghini, white Bentley or one of the Rolls Royces, silver or blue. So that's, uh, that could be a red flag. Um, it's certainly a, a red flag. Oh, that's where the money went. <laughs> it's certainly a red flag when you're doing any kind of, any kind of investigation. If the fraudsters, you know, living beyond their means, then, you know, that's definitely a red flag. Um, he also made large charitable contributions and once again, in his deposition, he said that if the bank had ever investigated the way that he was moving money in and out of accounts, uh, including his regular overdrafts of trust accounts, which are prohibited under the Florida law from being overdrawn, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of laws governing how you have to, have to handle trust accounts. He said if they had done that, then it would have easily ended his scam. So once again, you know, red flags are being missed. Um, due diligence is not being um, completed and, and they continue to go on until they can't and they're caught. But this case also led to some serious liability for the financial institution because they put letters out on their letterhead that Rothstein asked them to write and it, it created a whole world of hurt both criminally and civilly for the financial institution in this case. We're not going to uh, talk about that too much today but when I mentioned earlier that not only are investors duped in these schemes some, so sometimes are the professionals and in this one uh, the financial institution was arguably even in cahoots with the perpetrator. So you never know what you're going to find in these cases. <clears throat> well, let's talk a little bit about who these people are that are running these frauds. I am particularly interested in the psychology of these cases, both on the, the fraudster side and on the victim side. What makes this happen again and again and again? We know that it's out there. <clears throat> Why does it keep happening? Well, the Ponzi schemers... <clears throat> are really interesting people. They are intelligent and they're very likable. And they look you right in the eye and they smile and they make you feel good about yourself. And they're very confident and, and gregarious and charismatic. Um, they also, however, are very deceptive and too persuasive. You know, they're self-delusional and they're very, very greedy oftentimes. Um, I have a quote on the slide, Groucho Marx, the secret of, secret of life is honesty and fair dealing. If you can fake that, you've got it made. And that's kind of what their philosophy is. Um, you know, one of the, uh, uh, another presentation that I frequently do um, is how to detect the psychopaths. 
Uh, now, I'm not saying that all Ponzi schemers are psychopaths. Um, however, I was once giving this presentation, this very presentation, and somebody came up to me and said, oh, you have to read the book Snakes in Suits. Well, why is that? Well, because it's, uh, it's about psychopaths in the business world, not, not like Ted Bundy serial killer psychopaths, but psychopaths who infiltrate a company or a business and all of the havoc that they wreak. And I had already written my, my Ponzi Proof Your Investor book um, at the time I read this, and I had profiled the Ponzi schemer in my book. Well, when I read the psychopath book, I was blown away at how similar the descriptions were, um, which really does make me question, you know, what, what is it that gives a Ponzi schemer the capacity to steal from his own mother or his family members and to not really appear to feel bad about it and to just keep doing it? And, it may be that sometimes there's a personality disorder involved. And I, I put this uh, chart up here because this is a chart by um, Dr. Robert Hare, who actually wrote the book Snakes and Suits, I was just referring to, um, who came up with kind of the, the test, if you will, for detecting a psychopath. But, you know, even he says it could take up to six months because they are so good at deception and at lying and at manipulating that you can't always pick it up. Well, Ponzi schemers got the same benefit is it's really, really hard sometimes to see past that smile and that warmth and those promises to detect the fraud. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit uh, more about that. Um, but before we, well, well, actually, let's talk about, Coral, the common characteristics that we see in Ponzi schemes again and again and again. It's, you know, when, once you've familiarized yourself with a Ponzi scheme, it really is the same story, the costumes are different, the faces are different, but the, the story is the same. So we wanna give you a little bit of a flavor of the types of things that we see over and over again in these cases. Well, you know, similar to any kind of fraud investigation, I think generally people want to be trusting. I, I think for the most part, people do not want to think that they're being lied to. Um, you know, even in a, a, a an embezzlement case, if I'm doing an investigation, the first question I will ask the business owners is, who's your most trusted employee? And it's probably the 80 year old grandmother who's the godmother of their kids baking cookies. And I'll say that's the fraudster, because usually it is. Um, because how can you get away with, with perpetrating, perpetrating a fraud? You have to be trusted. If you're not trusted, you're not gonna get away with it. Um, so once again, it's all about establishing credibility. And so like even in the Madoff case, he, um, he was very involved in forming the NASDAQ, if I remember correctly. Um, he was very, very involved in the Jewish community. And so a lot of people trusted him because he was Jewish. And so he focused on those religious organizations. Um, so anytime that you can um, make a commonality with somebody that we're the same people, we're the, we, you know, we, we come from the South, um, we both are immigrants. Um, we both support this particular charity. We're Jewish. We're, you know, whatever can establish a common bond is going to allow you to have credibility. And we see that over and over again throughout all of these cases. You know, what, what's interesting about the affinity groups, you know, they, they, they spin in a group of immigrants or, you know, in churches we see a lot too. But they can also get really, really targeted. I, I saw a, a Ponzi scheme, the affinity scheme was this specific. It was evangelical Christians who are deaf. And the perpetrator was an evangelical Christian who was deaf. So why would he defraud people just like him? But you know, that was a scheme. And so, again, they're very, very hard to detect because you're going to trust the person who's part of your affinity group. And so... Um, Thinking about how you are being brought into a scheme is maybe the number one thing, your first thought. Who's bringing me in? Do I just assume that they vetted the scheme or am I investing because they said it's a good idea and I trust them? So that's an important point. All right, Coral, you wanna keep going? Sure, and I think we've talked about this before. You know, one of the things that people, um, you know, are drawn to, you know, high interest rates, guarantee returns, above market returns, and there's low risk to no risk, consistent returns. I mean, this is two-sided. On one side, this sounds very attractive to somebody who wants to get in on something on the front end um, that other people may not be privy to. But on the other hand, these are also red flags that need to be investigated. 
So it, it's kind of a dual purpose. Um, on the next, oh. go ahead. I actually, it's funny now having studied these for so long year after year, it, it almost feels a little Darwinian to me. Like I'm seeing the promises made changing a little bit because you can't really promise someone a thousand percent return in a month anymore, hopefully, because that's a pretty glaring red flag, right? right. So what you see are, 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 are different ways at it. Like all I'll return 2% profit to you every month. Well, okay, 2% is not a very big number, but that's 24% over a year. Is anyone making that kind of money, right? And so they want to make it sound good, but not so good that it's outlandish. And so I, I've seen these schemes really change the way that they promise those returns. Guarantees are also, uh, you know, a really, really big, there's no risk or if you're guaranteed a certain return, um, and those just make people feel good and trust. And so the Ponzi schemer is always out to make it sound good enough, but also to create that sense of, of comfort and trust in them. So very, very sinister again. Well, before you go to the next one, Ed has a question. He wants to know, won't all Ponzi schemes eventually blow up? How do perpetrators think about it in the long term? <laughs> they don't. Uh, I think... I think that most do eventually blow up. I think they end up in bankruptcy or they end up in receivership. Sadly though, I do think that some don't ever get revealed because the victims are just so embarrassed. They're so embarrassed that they got duped and that they lost money that they don't report it. Um, that they just take their lumps and they walk away because they don't want to tell anybody about it. Of course, we don't know if that's the case or what the percentage is. It's, you know, my sense in having talked to so many victims that there's a huge sense of shame involved in having invested, but most of them do. Uh, when you ask about what's in the perpetrator's mind, I mean, who knows? You know, when I, I, I sort of gave you a little bit of a flavor of, of the personality type, they are short-term thinking, probably. Uh, they're thinking about their own greed and how to spend the money. My personal experience, as I've interviewed a lot of these folks, when I come in on the first day to take over a case for a trustee or receiver, is that they often think that they're just one deal away from making it all okay. Well, it's just as if this one real estate happens, and I'm going to have more than enough money to pay everyone off. So I do think a lot of times, maybe they're thinking long term, but they're not thinking long term with any clarity that like it's all going to be okay because everything's gonna fall into place. So, I mean, I think every story is a little bit different in that regard. There are, of course, other people who just start out from out of the box and they're running a fraud just because that's what they're doing. And, and, you know, others, they start out running a legitimate business and it ultimately morphs into a fraud. So I think every circumstance is a little different there. I think that Madoff in one of his interviews when asked that same question, and, and you may have a better grasp on exactly what he said, but I think he said that, he really thought that the end of the world was coming. It was just going to blow up when 9-11 hit and then it would all go away. Um, I thought that was a pretty doomsday way of thinking how he was going to get out of it. But oops, I, I actually think he said that. Oh, I, you know, it's funny. I never heard that. I know that he was pretty darn stressed. I think he was hoping it would be discovered along the way. And he was shocked that it, it kept not being discovered. You know, when you watch the, the, the movie made for TV, right. you can just, I mean, they kind of displayed it like, I can't believe you didn't just ask me that question or run down that fact. And oh my God, I have to deal with this burden. I actually think when he got to prison, there might have been a small sense of relief that he wasn't carrying that weight anymore and, and, and growing the problem. But I mean, Again, who knows? I don't know that we'll ever know the truth in that regard. All right, well, let's um, talk about some more of the characteristics that we see. Um, you know, similar to the, the Madoff um, scheme, it sounds sophisticated and complicated because if you're getting in on something that most people aren't getting in on, you, you kind of, like Kathy said, you know, Mr. Madoff's guy, he must be smarter than me. I mean, he's got this split strike conversion strat strategy that nobody else has, which going to allow him to provide greater returns. Well, I myself tried to read, and, and I, I'm a finance person, tried to read what the, the split strike conversion strategy was and my head blew up. Um, but, you know, if you're the average investor, you, you want somebody that's got something sophisticated because that lends right. itself to making sense as to why this is making money and everything else isn't. Um, also, you know, this is, this is insider information. I know something that other people don't. 
um, acts, you know, I've got access to, um, you know, an opportunity that's not available to the public. So I think there's this peer pressure of, well, I better get in now. Um, you know, it evokes a feeling of a missed opportunity. Wow, if I don't get in this now, I'm gonna miss something that, you know, most people aren't privy to. Or it could be some secret technology or product. I think there's a lot of that going on right now um, because, yeah. you know, we are in a technological age and I don't think it's that far-fetched if somebody were to come on, come along with some new technology that as long as it sounded, you know, sounded reasonable or what have you, that it, it might, it might sound reasonable. And then I, you know, I just wonder, are people, you know, generally kind of, you know, greedy? I mean, is there a level of greed and the, the opportunity for easy money that, um, you know, we're all kind of susceptible to? And yeah, I, you know, I think that that's a factor as well. Well, and FOMO, fear of missing out. Although I'm not, I'm not quick to blame the victim. You know, it's not fair, right? If fraudster hadn't have been there, they never would have been duped. It, 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 that's a hard, it's a hard situation. Um, on the, the the secret technology or product point, um, you know, one of the bigger Ponzi schemes also from the past decade or so is the Bayou Group. And the principal of that one, I think his name is Sam Israel, he ended up in prison and he had a lot of time on his hands. So he decided to write an autobiography. Again, another super interesting read. Um, you know, and he was kind of a tell-all, you know, here's how I did it uh, type of a scheme. And one of the things he said was he came up with technology, not so much technology that was running the investment program, supposedly making money, but technology that he would show to investors to show how much of a return he could make. And so he would input their information and what they wanted to invest in. I think it was a stock scheme and, and then he'd push a button and it would spit out a result and it would say there's an 86% chance, you know, that you're going to make money. And people would be like, yes, you know, I'm going to do it and invest. And when he was writing his book, you know, and he said, well, I plucked that number from the sky. I mean, it was just some totally falsified bit of technology that he used to lure investors in. So you never know what's going to come at you. Um, all right. So let's, um, Carl, you want to take this one? Or just sure. sure. Um, yeah, this, and like in the Madoff case, very interesting, you know, the use of famous people, once again, to gain credibility. Um, if this person over here who's very successful is buying into this opportunity, then it, it must be okay. So in the Madoff case, um, there were very high profile investors that were burned along with a lot of other you know, poor victims, the, the Steven Spielberg Foundation, Kevin Bacon and Kira Sed Segwich, who are actors, Larry King, uh, all fell victim to uh, the Madoff scheme. Um, once again, we talked about donating to large charitable contributions. Oftentimes, these people have, you know, good um, pedigrees, good educational degrees, uh, you know, titles and organizations, past work experience. I mean, in the Madoff case alone, um, I mean, he really had a quite impressive pedigree and inroad into the financial markets that would make it seem like much more reasonable that he could be providing something that other people could not. Um, as Kathy mentioned earlier, using nationally known auditors and law firms and banks gives an air of credibility. Um, you know, providing consistent returns to, for certain people so that certain people can show that it is working. Um, and then, you know, you've got an extravagant lifestyle. I mean, we showed the example where the gentleman has 10, you know, 500, you know, thousand dollar to a million dollar car. But I think that if you're dealing with a financial professional who's supposed to be helping with your money, you like to see that they're doing well that they wear nice clothes and have a nice watch and have a nice car, because if they didn't, you'd wonder why they were handling your money. That's true. Okay. And then what tricks do they use, the sales tactics that they use to lure you in? Well, once again, it's, it's kind of geared to make you feel like it's an opportunity that you don't want to miss out on. Um, it is, you know, don't tell anybody else because it's limited amount of people are going to be able to capitalize on this. Um, you, how, you know, you need to do this today. That's how I feel like when I go to buy a car. Oh, well, if you don't sign today, the car won't be available tomorrow. Um, you know, there's limited supply. We're never going to get a car on a lot like this again. Um, 
it, you know, and one of the big things is, you know, if you're asking for information that should be readily available for a, a valid investment, they should have the paperwork and the backup information that you might like to have for your due diligence readily available. So if you're asking for information and you're sort of getting the push off, that could be a red flag as well. Um, bottom line is you don't want to be, um, you know, like I said earlier, they, they, you know, these people are playing on our, our human emotions to want to feel like we're in on something special. Um, these things do work. You don't want to lose out on opportunity. It hasn't been presented to everybody else. And they give you a sense of urgency that it needs to be done now. That way you don't have time to a second guess it or do your due diligence. You know, it's, it's amazing to me in these cases, um, the, how people will accept a non-response to a question. You know, I've gone through troves and troves of emails, you know, trying to unwind a Ponzi scheme and, and, and not even so much an investor, but maybe even like a salesperson who's bringing in other investors. I've seen over the course of a year or two years, the broker asking the perpetrator, you know, I really need the name of the auditor because investors are asking and, you know, one would think that would take two seconds to respond to, but oh, I'm on a plane, or oh, I just got off a plane, or oh, I'm, you know, I'm walking in a meeting, and two years will go by without an answer to the question of who's the auditor. Meanwhile, the salesperson figures the information's coming, so keeps selling, you know, the scheme to, to other investors, you know, things like that. There was another one, one of my favorite delay stories. The perpetrator had told the investors that the funds were being held in a brokerage account that required a minimum balance of a million dollars and that any return of funds to any of the pool participants would cause every member to lose all of their money. So in other words, everyone was, was told, well, you can't take your money out. You know, you got to wait until we're all ready to be done. And so the investors couldn't, couldn't wait. And so then investors asked for proof of that. And the perpetrator said that the corporate CPA had told him that they couldn't share company records because it was a private company. And one excuse after another to actually get any information about the investment. That's a big red flag, right? All right, let's um, talk about some other issues. Well, just to let you know, the no response will not work with Janine. Janine will keep at you <laughs> until you respond. <laughs> so Good. that technique or that tactic will not work with her at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I, I think that one of the things that runs true through a lot of these schemes as well, and we've, we've given a couple of examples, is the, the perpetrator is going to surround uh, himself or herself with friends and family, um, people that you know are either in on it or aren't on it. And if they're not in on it, they're not going to ask questions. I mean, in the, in the Madoff scheme, you know, there was questions about whether, you know, the wife knew or the two sons knew. And um, they may not have known, but it, you know, if they trusted their father and they asked questions and dad gave reasonable responses, then because that's their father or the husband, they didn't press on further and just kept doing what they were doing. Um, you know, having affiliated businesses, I mean, oftentimes what a red flag is with, um, with these types of things that there's layers upon layers of business and you really have to unravel an organization because the more that you layer businesses upon businesses you can disguise who's responsible for the underlying uh, transactions and businesses so that's something to be aware of um, you do like kathy mentioned earlier you do need to have certain investors have a history of positive returns or there's not going to be any anything to look at to say, yeah, see, this actually worked for us. And so it should work for you. And then oftentimes there's, there's paybacks. Um, you know, maybe there's people that are involved that maybe do know a little bit more than other people know, um, but are willing to not say anything because they're getting preferred paybacks. <coughs> Sorry, water. Um, <laughs> so <coughs> anyway, the biggest takeaway from this is the friends and family that you have involved so that people aren't asking okay. questions. All right. Thank you, Coral. We'll let you catch your breath there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so let's move to the investigation, right? Um, because the perpetrator is going to try to get you to have an emotional response rather than sort of a practical, thoughtful response. And they're going to try to, to play on your emotions. Yeah, that Sam Israel, the guy I was just telling you about from the Bayou group in his tell-all, 
said he admitted that he would just fly off the handle and appear to be crazy and irrational, knowing that that was going to instill fear in not only his employees, but investors. So they wouldn't ask him any questions because <laughs> they didn't want to get asked any questions. So we have to be mindful of let's not be emotional and let's look at this, you know, from a business standpoint. So one of the first things you're going to want to do is figure out what is the business I'm investing in? And, you know, my sort of rule of thumb is if I can't understand it after a five minute explanation, I'm not sure I want to invest in that. I want to be able to understand what is my money being used for? Why do you need investor dollars? And so once you are persuaded of that, is the investment strategy plausible? Is it going to be sustainable over some period of time? And then, of course, you really want to look for independently verifiable performance data, right? You don't just want to take their word for it, but you want to see, well, what's the market doing? What are you doing? And when I see the what are you doing, what can you give me as independent third-party data so I can verify what you're doing? I mean, for example, in Madoff, if anyone asked him what he was doing and what his volume was that he was trading, it would have exceeded you know, what the market was actually doing. So anyone who had done a little investigation there would have said you would have been swinging the market wildly if you were actually doing all these trades that you said that you were doing. Um, you know, another, yeah, there was another case with um, latex gloves, JT Wallenbrock, same thing. If anyone really sort of dove in to understand the scope of what that business was supposedly doing, they would have been selling something like 80 or 90% of the world's supply of latex gloves, which this small company wasn't doing at all. Uh, so it definitely makes sense to ask questions um, about the business model itself. And then certainly if there are, if there's any paperwork that you're given about the business model, you know, what are the legal provisions that are in there, you know, and where, how is the money flowing and is it going offshore? And if so, why? What's the purpose for the money going offshore? Um, if there's money going into personal accounts, what's the reason for that? I mean, those are more questions if you have access to the financial records and the bank records um, that you would want to ask. Sometimes those are hard questions to ask. But understanding the business model, why they need your money and how the money is flowing is, is super important. Um, and then, of course, we've already talked about the auditor a fair amount, but this is, this is I mean, I've had a case where the investors will give to me the offering memorandum that they had been given. And right on the front page, it says, you know, financial records audited by such and such a firm, which, of course, is usually one of the big firms. Well, I had one, I picked up the phone and I called that firm to see if I could get their records, their auditing records. They had never heard of the perpetrator before. The perpetrator just used the name of the auditor. So even a simple phone call wow. know, the auditor to see whether or not they even audited the books as is represented is a first step and is something that I don't think most people ever even think to do. Um, you know, another thing about the auditor is to maybe if it's not an auditor that you've heard of, run a little due diligence on it and see, you know, what's what. Is there any connection potentially to the principles? Um, in the Bayou Group case, had anyone done a really quick internet search on the auditor, if they had just done a Secretary of State search, they would have seen that the registered agent of the auditor was actually um, an insider of the company. So, um, you know, and, and in that case, the audit firm had been created and formed for the sole purpose of generating these false audit reports to give to the investors to bring in the money. So, again, a quick and Kathy, so just. So just to let people know, so you go to the sos.ca.gov and then you go to business search, you can type in the name of the business and then under the statement of information, that's where you see who's affiliated with that. Right, and the registered agent and yeah, exactly. There's a lot of, a lot of great, and I have unraveled many frauds by looking at the Secretary of State website. There's a lot of useful information in the fine print when you click on the PDFs and yes. all of that information comes up, absolutely. Um, oh, Kathy, another another thing too, if you're dealing with a CPA, <clears throat> well, for example, in California, you can go to the Cal CPA website and you can look up the individual CPA by either their first and last name or their license number. And if they have any disciplinary actions, they will all be detailed there. So that's a that's a very good starting place. I mean, absolutely. We're, we're, you know, we'll, we'll get to this. I know we're running out of time, but of course, on the internet, oh my goodness, there is so much information that is available. So many searches you can do for brokers, for salespeople, for real estate. I mean, for all of it. Um, if you find the right agency, you can often find a lot of disciplinary reports out there for free even. So definitely worth doing. Um, all right. Well, so then let's talk a little bit just about the paperwork. You know, 
read the paperwork that you're being presented. Now it might be falsified, so that's always a risk. But you you, you don't want to be bamboozled by just you know fancy brochures and marketing you know brochures and stuff like that. You actually want to dive a little deeper and see what independent third party records you can get your hands on. So you want to you know, ask the, you know, for the company and also look at the officers and the financial tra track record of all of these people. Um, evaluate the market, the potential market that the investment program is in. Um, any guarantees that you're provided or warranties or anything like that. Oftentimes in cases like these, the insiders will say, oh, I guarantee you're gonna get your money back. I'll give you a lien on my house. I had one case where he pulled the title to the, the principal's house who had guaranteed, you know, these investments to all of his family and friends, there must have been 19 different, you know, liens recorded against his house. So, I mean, the, the, getting a guarantee secured by the guy's house was utterly worthless. Um, so, wow. Yeah, to the extent that you can verify any of that information and you're being promised a first lien against the house to secure the position, you want to run that down and make sure that that's actually the truth. And, um, to have, and just to do a plug and how to run that down, you know, <laughs> As a realtor, we can let you know. We can run the title on the property to let you know if there's any liens or what the value of the property is. Use us and my fellow realtors that's on the call. <laughs> and, and absolutely, and frankly, I, I do. I lean very heavily on realtors if there's real estate involved at all because, again, there is so much information out there and you just have to ask for it and we do it. So thank you. I will be calling you next time. <laughs> Um, so account statements, same thing. You want to look at the statements that you're being given like in Madoff. Really? Why was he mailing them? Did anyone look at them to see that there were trades happening on a Sunday? You know, you want to be looking at the paperwork that they're giving you. Um, you know, what happens when, you know, the paperwork doesn't actually, uh, you know, match what you understand. They're one of my favorite stories here. I'm trying to move a little bit faster. There was another Ponzi scheme case, Greater Ministries. <laughs> the, the investors were told that uh, they were asked to sign forms that stated that their investment was a gift and that they should have no expectation of ever getting their money back, right? So it was right okay. there in front of them, but they actually didn't read it. Now it doesn't make it okay, obviously, but uh, that was actually um, a religious organization. And so people were just very trusting in connection with that scheme. Um, you know, so what do you do when the paperwork is falsified? Well, this is where it gets a little hard. And I don't know that I have any great advice other than to look for the zeros being, you know, off balance because somebody's typed them in. Now, I've seen that happen too, where, you know, investors are given bank statements to show $20 million when there was really only like $2,000 in a bank account and they added a bunch of zeros to it. Um, so yeah, see the, the Sam Israel again in his tell-all book, he said exactly how he did it. You know, using a combination of Photoshop, Excel scanners, and laser and inkjet printers, I was able to make very convincing forgeries of nearly every document from the bank. I could create forgeries so quickly no one suspected that they weren't the real thing. Same thing in another case, um, the Peregrine case, um, R Russell Wassendorf, for any of you that were following that one, I think it was out of Chicago a number of years ago. He actually wrote a very long tell-all suicide note when he just, the gig was up for him. Um, I mean, I don't know whether it's a good or bad thing. He actually didn't die. Um, so he went to <laughs> because his note was a roadmap to the whole fraud. But he said the same thing. He said, I was able to conceal my crime of forgery by being the sole individual with access to the bank accounts that were held by the entity. No one else in the company ever saw the bank accounts. They were always delivered directly to me. When they arrived in the mail, I made counterfeit statements within a few hours of receiving the statements, and I gave those forgeries to the accounting department. So the auditors, the accountants who were preparing all of the financial reporting that the investors are relying upon was falsified by the principal who's modifying the bank records. So even though the auditor thinks that they're looking at the bank records, they're actually looking at forgeries. So again, it's very hard. I just sort of throw that out there to make people aware of the, the, the depths that people will go to conceal frauds. It really is rather remarkable. Uh, you know, another thing to look for is how are you hearing about it? You know, we talked about that a little bit before. Is it from an affinity scheme or is it in an advertisement or is it a testimonial? And is the testimonial the one name that you were given by the perpetrator to talk to? Or can you find other investors who maybe much, uh, who, who maybe weren't offered up, but you're aware of, you could talk to them about their experience because it may be that the perpetrator's only giving returns to the one person that he wants to give testimonials, whereas everyone else is like, I'm not getting my money back and they wouldn't have such a good testimony. 
Uh, also, you know, these are just kind of funny. Sometimes the name itself is very telling. You know, there was literally one called Scam Investments. <laughs> it just kills me. I'm like, I don't know that I would be investing in that one. But you also want to look at the name and is it tied geographically to, um, you know, where the business is or what the business is. Um, I see so many of these, and, and this is not to say that every business that uses the name of the individual is a fraud, but so many of the frauds are the individual's names. Um, because again, they have a very strong sense of self. And so why, you know, like Madoff, why not use his own name when doing the fraud? So I want, think real quick, um, Nilly had a question. Yes. What's the question? Uh, she wants to know what was the name of the case, but I'm trying to ask you to unmute Nilla. Is that the Greater Ministries case where they, um, the people were told? N Nilla, what, which, uh, what are you talking about? Which case? It was the one that she spoke of. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It was the one that she spoke of before where um, the guy committed, was trying to commit suicide, but it wasn't successful and he was doing all the forgeries. Oh, oh, um, Peregrine Financial. Mm, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right. Let's. Uh, so now let's let's dive in a little bit. Uh, Coral, this is your place, right? This is the all these background searches and these things that we really do to dig in. And you're on mute. Coral. Um, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, I mean, there is so much information that is publicly available. Um, I had a, a, a case where I was trying to find somebody and all I knew was this guy's first name and it was literally nothing more complicated than like John and I knew what kind of work he did. I think I had this guy's Facebook, LinkedIn, knew where he worked within about 15 minutes. Um, there you can, you know, there's background searches that you can do. Um, you can, like I said earlier, you can check websites to check, you know, whether or not people's licenses have any kind of disciplinary actions. Um, there's, you know, you can find out their educational degrees. Um, uh, you can do lean in judgment searches. I mean, so many of these cases that we talked about, they had previous lawsuits and information that was out there had somebody done a search. You can see whether somebody's had a bankruptcy. Um, so there's, there's just really, there's a bevy of information on the internet that you can get. It's not, not really not that difficult to find. Regarding the lien and judgment search, where will you go for that? To do lien and judgment searches? I mean, like Lexis, um, there, there are a number of providers. Those can cost money. Um, you know, I, I often will have the, the real property records checked if it's real property that's involved, or you would check with the Secretary of State if there are you know, maybe UCC filings against a particular thing. Um, you know, it, it, and if it's a judgment that where you're not worried about it being secured, you would want to look in, uh, you know, the, the, the various courts to find a judgment. But if a judgment has been recorded and turned into an abstract of judgment, that's going to get picked up in real property records. Yeah, so back to real property records. Yes, realtors. <laughs> Uh, yeah, some of these things you have to pay for, but you'd, you'd be very surprised about if you just do some digging, how much information you can find out um, on your own. Right. Um, and then I think the next slide is similar to that. Um, you know, if you're, does the company have a real website or is it just sort of a sham company? Is it a real physical address or is it, you know, Sam Smith at yahoo.com? Um, you know, does it, does it have an air of legitimacy? Um, you know, one of the things that I think is tricky here is you want to look for negative news coverage, but you want to look for positive news coverage as well. But then you have to worry about whether you can rely on what you're, what you're receiving. So I have a, a lawsuit right now where two people are suing each other, one suing person for putting negative Yelp reviews out there that has crushed his business. But after depositions are helped, just found out that both sides, both of these guys were doing false uh, Yelp um, reviews to pump up their business. And so then you wonder how reliable Yelp is at all. Um, so, I mean, you can look to these things, but you can't rely on one, you know, one independent source to say, okay, this is good or, or this is bad. It's just one other thing to consider. Yeah, it's, it's very challenging. You know, um, I had a case where, or I know somebody had a case, actually one of my case, where there was a, a business address, you know, 
where people said, you know, here's where the business is. Well, when you put the address in on the Google Earth, where you can actually see, it was vacant land. There wasn't actually even a building oh, there. <laughs> that's a good one. Oh, yeah. I mean, it goes on and on and on, the, 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 the things that people do. So, you know, the other thing about positive news coverage is um, oftentimes they are press releases issued by the company itself. So those are going to be completely worthless. So you have to kind of look behind the source of who's posting whatever it is out on the internet. Absolutely. Um, okay, Coral, do you want to keep going? Um, I think we've kind of talked about this earlier, yeah. so yeah. we can probably skip since we're running out of time. Okay. Um, same thing with operational issues. I think we've, we've largely covered a lot of this too. You just want to see, is it being micromanaged? How is it, how is the business itself uh, being handled on an operational uh, basis? And then you just want to look past all of these credibility cloaks that we've already talked about. Um, don't just take anybody at face value because you never know. I had a case where she told me she had her degree from Caltech. Very impressive young lady. She had a PhD. They hadn't even heard of her. Um, again, the week I called up the school and they were like, I've never heard of her. So anyway, you want to just don't take anything at face value. So these are just our takeaways um, for you all to look, you know, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. You know, we hear that again and again and again, yet when it's really good, we want to believe it. <laughs> so um, thank you everybody for participating. I want to remind everybody again that if you do want MCLE or CPA in California, um, do send me an email with my address is in the chat, uh, kphelps at diamondmccarthy.com, and I will get you out a certificate in the next couple of days. And thank you, everybody, and thank you, Tony and Janine, for hosting. Yeah, thank you. This is fun. Well, thank you for always. Um, I'll mute yourself, Janine. Wait, I'm asked her to unmute. But yeah, thank you ladies for, you know, joining us. I mean, this was great information. I mean, I definitely like, you know, your due diligence business model, you know, the five minute, if you can't explain your business in five minutes, there's something wrong with that. And of course, find out what the purpose of the investors funds, you know, that's important. And understanding if the investment strategy is plausible or sustainable. Mm -hmm. And check for independent, ver you know, verify the, the data, independently go to the different websites you know if they're you know verify their licenses verify they have any prior acts or disciplinary marks on their record and evaluate the legal provisions so go to attorney <laughs> and go to a cpa to review things before you sign so thank you for that janine do you have anything you'd like to add well i thought the presentation was extremely enlightening and sometimes the obvious, we tend to brush over, but really we need to question everything. Trust but verify is what I hear all the time. You know, it's that we don't want to live in a world where we can't trust people, but we don't want to blindly trust them, right? So right. we want to just take the extra step to verify. Well, okay. Trust and verify. Terry, do you like to add anything? Um, just well done. I'm an elder law attorney. So this is really important because many of my clients are subject to the friends and family schemes, I call it, mm -hmm. or the phone calls right. or from their church members or, or other groups. So thank you. It was, it was nice to know that it doesn't pass the smell test and it probably won't. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And anyone, please unmute yourself if you'd like to add anything. If I can see you. I very, I very much, I think I'm mute. Nope. No, we can hear you. Oh, oh, great. I, I have heard um, Kathy speak before when she spoke to the LA County Bar Association. I very much would like this program and all of you to present to the Professional Fiduciary Association of California. And I think Terry would, oh. would agree with that. Because true. they, the Professional Fiduciary Association of California is, um, uh, they're all California licensed professional fiduciaries. And when people end up getting conserved or the trust, the trustee, the family member trustee starts doing monkey business and everything else, all of that ends up, ends up getting dumped into the probate court. And they need to know everything that you've been presenting here today. 
Um, they're doing things on Zoom and there are chapters all over and PFAC is the Professional Fiduciary Association in California. Uh, they, they need you. They We'd be happy to. That's great. I will forward the information. <laughs> I agree with you, um, Carol, because I'm a member of PFAC also. So you're so right. Yes, about well, that, the great idea. That I was on the I was on the working group when California created uh, the Professional Fiduciary Bureau. That's and, right. And they, the 25th annual conference was absolutely fantastic. It was just it was all, it was all virtual. But the presentations were absolutely top notch, detailed. It was not lectures. It was dialogue and conversation, and it was how to. And that's what this this has been. So yeah, definitely, you two ladies definitely should speak with PFAC. They would really appreciate that. Especially, I mean, you're dealing with a lot of people who are dealing with conservatorships, and they're being trusted with you know people's funds. You know, so they really do need this kind of information so that they can, you know, fulfill their fiduciary duties. And I think the biggest problem that Terry, uh, this is a problem I run into, and I, I expect you do also, is that when the, when the elderly person or the disabled person names a family member as the trustee, well, she'll take care of it. Usually the family member has no idea what the duties are they don't understand what the responsibility is. They think contractually and they do not understand that the fiduciary duty is a one-way duty. So I'm noticing that the courts are much more willing now to uh, appoint a professional fiduciary instead of a family member who's never done that job before. And it's a, so it, to me, it's a professional fiduciaries that really need to have this information. Yeah, totally yeah. agree. I think it's important. Absolutely. Very. Get the word out. Great. Well, I'll be sending your contact information. Okay. On <laughs> Sounds good. Do we have anyone else? And by the way, I just, oh, Robert. Oh, I thought it was a, um, I'm not as well dressed as most of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Important material. I had a uh, had a client who passed away, leaving twenty uh, supposed contracts for ATM machines. Uh, some of you guys may be involved with the NASI. Uh, yeah, so familiar. Yeah, so she had like twenty vent, uh, ATM machines. She thought she was going to be able to give to other people, and turns out nothing ever happened. So that it is a problem when suddenly tens of thousands of dollars like just you know vaporize it. So it's. Uh, uh, she passed away, but it you know it still hurt a lot of people. Yeah. So thank you. Sure thing. Yeah. Do we have anyone else before we end? Just checking. You have to unmute yourself before we end. But yeah, I'm going to keep echoing what. Coral, I mean, what Carol said, you definitely need to make sure you understand this if you're in any type of fiduciary um, position. Okay, well, I think that's all of our questions. I put in the chat box the emails for Kathy and Coral, along with um, the link to her, um, her blog. It's called the Ponzi Scheme Blog.com, and also a link you can actually buy her books on Amazon. Thank you. So, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Yay. Have a nice rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. you. Everyone take care. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Tani, for inviting. Well, thank you for attending. And, and.